Welcome to Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam, a podcast about navigating adolescence without losing our minds. Each week, I guide you around the teenage landmines with practical tips, simple solutions, and words of encouragement. I'm your host, Dr. Cam. Let's get on with the show. Welcome parents. If you're uncomfortable or unsure about how to talk to your teen daughter about puberty, sexuality, birth control, this episode is for you. Today I'm joined by Dr. Jennifer Lincoln, a board certified OBGYN who is passionate about helping girls understand their bodies and feel empowered to advocate for themselves. She's the author of Let's Talk About Down There, and OBGYN answers all your burning questions without making you feel embarrassed for asking. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> Dr. Lincoln also serves on the medical board of Flow Health Incorporated, the number one women's health app, and contributes to media to such as Today, Good Morning America, Newsweek, Parents Magazine, and Cosmo. Dr. Lincoln is going to help us tackle the talk and other tough health conversations with our teams. Welcome, Dr. Lincoln. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really in the chat. Yeah, I know. This is this is such an important topic. And I have my own personal stories of trying to do this well and failing miserably. But no. let's, <laughs> let's just start with your, your backstory. How did you get into focusing on empowering young girls about their bodies? Yeah, I think, you know, I going into medicine and, and choosing to be an OBGYN, it's not just a I don't know how to say it. It's one of those fields where you have to be really passionate about educating. Um, I think it's, it's obviously what we do is very unique, very in a way intimate. People are telling us things that, you know, they might not tell anybody else. And so we have to be there to meet them. And what I saw is just so many people, so many women, especially being ashamed to talk about topics, afraid, thinking that I would judge them, thinking from what other people told them, whether it was their parents or society or a boyfriend about how their bodies were dirty or bad or shameful, just to see how much of that layered on to what should just be basic healthcare. um, I just really, my heart broke for them. And I understand because I came from a background where you know, we didn't talk about this stuff at home and, you know, it's abstinence only education. And it was sort of like, you whisper like vagina, like you don't say these things out loud. Um, And it's for parents who are watching this and they're like, oh my goodness, that's what I do too. Like that's, that's not, um, you shouldn't feel bad about that because we only do what we've been taught. Right. So it's not to say that you can't change or once you know better, you do better. What else do we expect in a society that is afraid to say the word vagina or tampon on like, you know, regular morning news. Um, So I started social media to educate and it's just been, it's just been so fun building community and seeing what kind of things people share, but also heartbreaking to see it's 2022 and the stigmas that are still out there and the misinformation that we could just talk about that all day. Um, So it's fun to educate in a completely different way and to have people feel like there's a space that's safe for them where they can talk about things, ask questions and know that they're just like everybody else. Like we all have the same questions. It's so important. You said misinformation. So, I mean, now where you can go down rabbit holes of misinformation Mm -hmm. on the internet, I think it's amazing. And I know you have a really strong presence on TikTok, which I love because that's where your (laughs) audience is, right? It is. We have so much fear of social media. And yet I see people like you who are actually edu- using it to educate. So tell us a little bit just about your TikTok channel. Now we're <laughs> going to go into helping us. Have- I know. No, listen. So I, when TikTok was starting to get big, like this was before the pandemic, when doctors, like a couple doctors were on TikTok. And I really started on Instagram. That's where my, my main focus was. And my friends who were on there were like, Jen, you need to be here because your audience is here, right? Like Gen Z, young kids, and not children, but like young teens, people mm-hmm. who have no idea about periods, you know, anything else. And, and I was like, you guys are so cute. I will never do that. (laughs) I'm doctors really on TikTok. And then I said, okay, fine, I'll make one. I'll put it up there. And overnight it got something like a million views and just the comments and the questions. I was like, okay, they, once again, you know, my smart friends were right. And I should listen to them. And it just sort of took off. And uh, my content has evolved. I feel as my following has evolved because it used to be like this, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds on TikTok. And now we, we old people, right? We 40 year olds, like we're ruining it and we're on there. So my audience has changed. And so the breadth of topics I cover has changed, but it's really the same underlying theme, which is things that you 
weren't taught in school, didn't feel like you could ask your doctor, broken down into very simple, catchy things um, and educating. I mean, you have to be able to get your point across in like 15 seconds. Yeah. And I think what's the scariest part of TikTok, which is great stuff, like my stuff can go viral, but so can the garbage. And what I have learned as a doctor is I see what my patients are seeing and they're like, Dr. Jen, did you see this trend or this or that? And I didn't even know this was something my patients were worrying about. And then I see it on TikTok. And so I can address it. So I feel like it's helping me be a better doctor. Um, and then also like, I just really enjoy watching like, you know, like the babies that, you know, smile for the first time and like the dogs Aww. and the puppies, like that, that's also, it can be a little therapeutic at times too. <laughs> it can. I mean, I had to take it off my phone because I couldn't stop scrolling. I'm like, I, I just can't get rid of it because I, I know too many monkeys opening gifts that mm-hmm. I couldn't get away from. Oh my goodness, seriously. <laughs> so, okay. No matter how hard we try. And I was like, I'm trying to be that like, Cool mom that's comfortable with all this stuff. And I still am not comfortable. My daughter's far more comfortable than I am with all this, right? I feel like I did my job well and I hit you it. You did then. You're fine. You're totally fine. She's but fine. Yeah. I know. She asked me a question. I'm like, ah. um, so how do we, first of all, address this with our kids? And, and when do we start? Yeah. I mean, how do how do we begin these conversations? Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, it was the conversation, right? And for me, it was in the fourth grade and there was the class that my parents actually pulled me out of because they wanted to teach it at home. And they, so it was like a whole thing. And it was like a one-time conversation and you check the box. Okay. We talked about sex and periods and where babies come from. We spent an hour. We're good. We move on. And that's really not how it's supposed to be. That puts a ton of pressure on parents. Like we have to get this right this one time we talk about it and it makes it a whole thing like a, oh my goodness, we're talking about this and we should be embarrassed as opposed to just weaving it into our daily lives so that our kids are just like, oh, well, okay. Today we're talking about periods. Tomorrow we'll talk about how to wash your hands to, you know, not get your, like, it's just all part of your health overall. So I tell people these conversations start when your kids are babies. And then I usually get the look like, I am not telling my kindergartner or my two-year-old, you know, where sperm comes from. And I'm like, nope, that's not what I mean. I mean, age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, which means that, for example, you start using the correct words. And again, if people are watching this and they're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't say penis and vagina. I can't say it. Or I've used these silly words. Like, it's okay. You can always, you can always, you know, get back on course or change things incrementally. Um, So it's about calling names what they are. It's about weaving that into regular conversations and not like making your child feel ashamed when you, when he asks a question about his penis or he's like, mommy, why does this feel good? Like, oh my goodness, don't touch that. Just normalizing things. And then as they get older, you kind of weave those things in. You're talking about consent from, you know, when they don't want to hug grandma, that will help later when you're talking about consent in terms of sexual relationships. And it's okay if you have no idea what's going on because we weren't taught. So finding resources that can be helpful, whether it's books or websites, I think one of my favorite parenting tricks is you have a book and I learned this from my friends, by the way, you know, a book that you've read through, you think is a good resource and is appropriate for your kid. And you show your child, your teenager or whatever, and say, Hey, this book's got really good information in case you don't want to talk to me about it. I'm just going to leave it here. Yeah. And then they can read it on their own. And they, they see that they can come to you with questions. Um, it's just about keeping the door open. And it's okay if you feel like uncomfortable because you can even use that as a launching point for your teen and being like isn't it so silly that I'm uncomfortable to talk about vaginas why do we think this is and then you can talk about the issues with society and how we make our you know us feel ashamed and it really it just you become that safe space for your kids to ask questions yeah what are some of the biggest like misconceptions that kids are coming with that parents need to be aware of Mm -hmm. oh that's a good one so I would say with you know with um misconceptions that like older kids, like teenagers have that they come to their parents. I think so many of them just don't understand the basics of like, what is a period and can you get pregnant before you have your first period? The answer is yes. Um, you know, the idea of even what it means to have sex, like they don't understand that, you know, I think one, a big thing that I see is a lot of teenagers who've, who are, you know, they don't want to have sex, but they do everything but that. And they don't understand Mm -hmm. that they can still, you know, get and transmit sexually transmitted infections or this idea that you can use the withdrawal method. And that's a great form of birth control. There's just a lot of things that teenagers just, if we don't talk about it, they're going to try and figure it out on their own, talk to their friends, go to the internet, which sometimes great stuff is out there. And sometimes horrible stuff is out there. I think that's a, that's a big one. Um, and it's just because they, they, 
just weren't taught or by not talking about it in schools and only talking about abstinence, they then think that they can't talk about these things. And for people listening who are like, well, of course we talk about abstinence. Absolutely. Like I'm a huge fan of it because it is the only thing that's hundred percent effective at not getting pregnant. Um, it's not the only thing. And we know that when we only teach that in schools, it doesn't help delay onset of sexual, um, you know, starting to have sex and it just increases their risk of pregnancy and infection. And so we have actual data to show that. Um, that it's not helpful. So it's part of the picture, but not the whole thing. So if you, like, let's say your kids are getting to the age and it, it starts much younger than all of us think, which is something I'm not saying to be, to scare you. I'm just saying that if you don't think your kids are, think about this or are talking about this, they mm-hmm. are, yep. <laughs> um, it's everywhere. So how do we make sure and start that conversation if we're like, okay, I don't really talk to my child about this stuff. Whenever I try to bring it up, they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so how do we start this conversation in a way and where do we start? Yeah, I think one of the best entry points, because something that my parents didn't have to worry about, you know, social media wasn't a thing. And so for kids who have phones and have access to social media, like TikTok and Instagram, trust me, they are looking at these accounts. They are and not in a bad way. I'm saying, you know, they're seeing stuff. They might see some bad stuff out there. They they have unfettered access in a way that generations before didn't have to seeing things that are either accurate or also completely not accurate. You know, the days of like, oh, the Playboy magazine under your bed are gone because you can get that in two seconds, just going on a, you know, going on your your phone or or a web page. And trust me, parents, kids know how to, they know how to get around these things. So I think it's important too. A great entry point is if your kid has social media, is to be like hey, what are you seeing about your body or about these things? And they might be like, mom, I don't want to talk to you about this the first time, but it's making an impression. And they're like, oh my gosh, she actually cares. Or like sit there and scroll through social media together. I think that is a great way to be like, what did you think about that TikTok? What about this? What about that? Um, I've had some parents who've said, they don't feel comfortable talking about these things, but they've given them my account and they've said that they have to follow me. And then they talk about like kind of the things that they've seen there and it's sort of opened up a doorway. So I think using social media as an entryway can be um, can be a, a good way to do it. I also think like, you know, the idea of like saying, here's some books, there's really great programs too online. Um, a website that I really like is called Girlology. And it's not just for parents of girls. They also have content for for guys and non-binary kids too, under their diology section. But it's these little snippets, these little programs you can go through either as a whole, like your own little course or just checking out different parts. And it goes from periods to puberty, sex, birth control, hygiene, all that stuff. And it's developed by a pediatrician and a gynecologist. And it's just cool because you can kind of work through it together. Um, and it's just good, legit evidence-based information. And people learn differently. Um, I always say that when we sit down and you probably know this, right. And you you look at your teenager and you're like, let's talk about this. Like they don't want to talk, but it's those conversations when you're like driving somewhere to get ice cream or you're watching a movie and you have, you know, there's a sex scene. Use that as an entry point and say, wow, do you really think that she consented to that? Or, you know, you don't have to make everything a learning opportunity, but just showing that you weave it through. Like, I think it's really important. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's really good. And talking about you know, protecting and being safe. I think that's a hard conversation to have because you don't want to establish this fear, Mm -hmm. right? And this, or shame or any of that. So how do you, how, like, do you have any recommendations on how we talk about being able to say no, being able to save that space? I know um, a big thing that we have fear with is just what is expected of kids now. Like Mm -hmm. you talk to girls and they expect things like sending nudes or, mm-hmm. you know, oral sex and things like that. They're like right. well, they're expecting me to do that or they're right. going to date me. So how do we talk right. to them about yeah. this? Uh, it's so hard. I get it. It's so hard. I think that just having these conversations um, and being honest about it. And I think that it's about striking a balance because so much of sex education is either abstinence only, or it's fear-based, which is don't have sex. You'll get pregnant. You'll get gonorrhea no one will love you. And then you will die because you will have gotten some horrible disease. And it's important to talk about the consequences of sex, but it's also important to talk about sex in a functional way and say, yeah, people who are in a relationship and want to feel good. And that's a way that they show that they care about each other. And because what you have to think about is when your children are older adults, they have to undo all of that. Like, oh my God, sex is horrible. But now I'm supposed to, you know, be a sex kitten when I'm married and 
you know, and have you ever even talked about the clitoris with your kids? Like these are not bad things. It's just biology. So I think it's about striking the balance and saying that sex is like anything else. It can be really awesome or it can be really harmful. Just like, you know, driving in a car can be really great and you can also die. So like, how do we do it safely? And knowing that talking about how to keep yourself safe, all these things doesn't make your kids go out and have sex. We know that. We know that when we do comprehensive, medically accurate sex education, it actually decreases their rates of, of initiating sex, makes it later, doesn't increase their partners because they're informed. And I think that a huge thing is, again, this isn't just about sex, but when they're younger, talking about expectations, what the group is doing, what do you, you know, hypotheticals. Oh, so your friend did this. How did that make you feel? You didn't want to do it. Do you know that you can call me at any time? No questions asked. Do you know that I will always be in your corner? I think that's huge. Um, and just using these little scenarios like, oh yeah, so your friend said that she thought she had to, you know, perform oral sex in order to keep a guy around. What do you think about that? You know, why do you, do you think that that, you know, just what do you think about that? I think is a great way to open up the conversation. Even if they clam up, they are listening and they love the fact that they know that they can talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. And even if they're not going to say to you right then, they're not mm -hmm. thinking in their head, what do I think about that? Right. It's right. Exactly. Making them start to process and think mm -hmm. about it. So yeah. what if you have a sense that your child is sexually active mm -hmm. and you're like, no, I don't want them to be, or like, <laughs> like, what do you do if you, if you believe they are? Yeah. I think when we're talking about girls, especially, I think it is so important to give them a space to talk to another trusted adult. And so, so in my world, that's an OBGYN or, you know, whether it's their pediatrician or family care doctor, whoever, but the American College of OBGYN recommends that the first visit happens between the age of 13 to 15. Now, the vast majority of us did not go to an OBGYN at that age, so don't feel bad if you didn't take your kids. But the point of that is not that they'll have an exam, not that they'll have a pap smear, but that they can have just, they can start to build a relationship with somebody. So if they choose to have sex or if they're having issues with their periods, they already have somebody they can go to. And this isn't an, an, a situation where you come in and we throw you out of the office and then we're like, so you want to have sex here? You want birth control? Like that's not <laughs> what happens. Right? It's just about educating. And so if you think that your child is sexually active, it's a great time to say, listen, we're just going to go to the doctor, know that you can ask whatever. And it's important to establish that. And even in the presence of your child's doctor to say, I know that everything here is confidential unless my child says they're going to hurt themselves or somebody else. And I want to give you guys the space to talk. And I just want you to know that you can ask and whatever you need and you step out of the room. And that might feel really hard to do as a parent because we're so used to like knowing everything about our kids, but this is part of them growing up. And I think that if you think your child is sexually active, ignoring it or wishing it away is, is, is not going to change anything. So it's important to have access to things like to talk to your kids about how to have sex safely. And in my world, that means condoms. That means having access to emergency contraception to just saying, listen, you can come to me. If you don't feel comfortable coming to me, here's your doctor. Here are some great websites. I love websites like Bedsider. Um, it's got fantastic evidence-based information because if they're going to go online and search stuff, at least give them the tools and say, this one is a good place to go. Um, I just think it's really important to, to be forthcoming. And then remember back when you were a teenager, like it's, you know, we're all, <laughs> we could all wish that our kids would never be like us, but like, don't you wish you had a parent who would have helped you get your own information or stay safe? And it's amazing now where there is so much more information accessible to them and good information. So yeah. I love, and I'll get the links from you too, and share yeah. them up the places the parents can go to that they know this is good, trustworthy stuff yeah. to send them to them because they're going to I had none of it. I mean, I was like talking to my friends in high school and then my sorority sisters, this, you know, as my kids say in the olden days, in the nineties, you know, before, like, you know, you could just look something up and I mean, you made really bad decisions or we didn't know what was true. So the fact that there is good stuff out there, like use it and and give, be proactive instead of just waiting for them to like find bad information or, you know, they're trying to figure it out on their own because it can be really hard to know what's good out there. It is, but, and I, I want to just emphasize what you said, Dr. Jen, because I think this is so critical is that even if, if you believe your kids are sexually active or even before that, like, I think it's actually good to just make not assume that they are but just act like they are to mm -hmm, give them right, that right. information right that it is far better to educate them and be open and transparent about this information than to say don't do it or try to stop 
because the education is exactly what protects them. Yep. Absolutely. So that is, that is amazing. I think that is so key. Um, and I, I think the other thing I like my, my story was I got the note, you know, that my daughter was going to have sex ed. And I was mm-hmm. like, I don't want my daughter going in there and being like the clueless one. So I right. went and shared everything and I, they only covered like the small amount. I was like, <laughs> Oh, didn't have to do all that. <laughs> But oh, now, but how yeah. great for her, right? Like, like now we have know, the diagrams and the everything. But yeah, <laughs> now we have the conversations and it's all fine. Oh, I think. But it, awesome. yeah, I was like, I didn't have to do all that yet. Yeah. Um. So I think. Um. I guess asking them what they know too, right? Yes. I love that as a technique. And I, you know, cause people say, what do you do when your kids ask where do babies come from or what is an abortion or what is this? And I always answer with, what do you think? Because then that tells you already what they know or what they're actually trying to get at. If they're like, babies come from the hospital. You're like, you know, if you're, if a kid's three or four, you're like, yeah, true, you know, and they're not asking like for, you know, all the details necessarily. Right. So they will tell you kind of where they're at. And I also love that. Cause that gives you a chance to be like, let me think. <laughs> Yeah. And what information do I need to correct versus right. what all the information I Definitely. need to give? Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. So how do people find you? So you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. It's Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. I'm also on Twitter at Dr. Jen Lincoln. Um, but I would say for parents who are looking for information, um, I think what might be most helpful for long form content is I do have a whole playlist on my YouTube for parents talking about what you need to know about periods, websites that I love, um, how to talk about these things. I think that can be really helpful. And then, you know, more shorter form stuff on my, on my TikTok and Instagram. Um, and then my website is also drjenniferlincoln.com and my book, your book, let's talk about down there, which I think is a really great resource, not because I wrote it and I'm not trying to, you know, like self-promote because I wrote a book when I was like, you know, I wish I had something when I was 16, 17. This is not the book that like tells you where babies come from. This is the book like you hand to your kid, like maybe before they go off to college or their senior year. And it really talks about birth control periods, care down there, going to the doctor, like all the questions that they really want to know. And it's very visually um, you know, short to the point, illustrated, inclusive, um, and all evidence-based and referenced because like I said, there's so much bad stuff out there that I want people to know like, okay, is, is that true? Where can I get more information? I think that's so important. So all I love, those places. Yeah. And I love that it's available where kids are. Mm-hmm. Yep. You, you know, gotta go. That's one, public health. You gotta go. Reading, but she'll go watch the YouTube videos yep. and the TikTok. So I'm like, I'm going to yeah. go right now and introduce her on all that. You're like here. So you never knew that like, you know, public health means making TikToks and like, this is, it's going to where people are. So for all those doctors who were like, oh, you should be on TikTok. And I made fun of them. They were totally right. <laughs> they were totally right. right? It's all good stuff. And yeah. now we know there's stuff that they're scrolling through. That's actually good. Yeah. So before we go, any parting words of encouragement for parents with teenagers? Yeah. I just, I think parents you're doing, we are always so hard on ourselves. So you're doing a much better job than you think you are. And if you feel like you're getting it wrong or you don't know what to do or you're uncomfortable, yeah, that's like all of us. And just know that it's okay to say, I'm not so sure. I don't know. Just being that trusted person in your child's life, even when you think they're not listening, even when you think that they're like horrified and and like, oh my God, mom, you're talking about this again makes such a difference for them to know that they can come to you. Like you don't know. I think that's the most important thing that we know for kids for success is having a stable adult in their lives that they know they can talk to. Um, So just know that you're doing a better job than you think you are. And um, you know, just if you're having concerns or questions, partnering with your, with your child's healthcare provider, looking out for good information. um, Seriously, you're doing much better than you think. (laughs) I think people need to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jen. I am so grateful you could join us today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you, parents, for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us. I do really appreciate you. And if you want to learn more about how to help your teens thrive, you can grab my top 10 secrets for raising teens at askdrcam.com slash parenting tips. Until next time, have a peaceful, positive, calm day. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining me today on Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam. Make sure to visit my website, www.askdrcam.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show again. While you're at it, 
If you found value in this episode, I'd appreciate a rating on iTunes and hey, why not share it with a friend too? Be sure to tune in to my next episode. And remember, parenting teens may not be easy, but with my help, it can be a whole lot easier than this.